Welcome, brothers. Uh, 1997, January of 1997, maybe it was, it was 97, uh, was perhaps one of the best days of my life. Born and raised in Colorado, and I, my entire life, was a Denver Bronco fan. So up until that year, my record was 0-4 in Super Bowls. Now, my second favorite team was the Minnesota Vikings, which would make me 0-8 in Super Bowls. <laughs> Had I been a Buffalo Bills fan, I would not be standing here before you. Huh? <laughs> but I remember watching the Super Bowl, and really, I mean, as a kid, as only a kid, you raised, and that was really the big thing, Notre Dame football and, and Denver Bronco football, my home. And, and I remember being in the friary here, it was the old friary, and I'd been ordained for about a year, year at the time, and the Broncos were obviously playing the Green Bay Packers in the Super Bowl. So anyone who's from Green Bay or, or Wisconsin, sorry about that, Tom. It's just something you're going to have to deal with, though, huh? But it was, just, it was just fantastic, and I remember literally jumping up and down and jumping on the table that was in front. It was just a small table. It wasn't a high table. I wouldn't jump on a high table. That would be ridiculous. Just a small table. And I remember one of the older friars looking at me like, what is wrong with you? But it wasn't anything that I had planned. There was just an excitement. I mean, we've all probably experienced something like that, that, that you see something, a, a, your team scores a goal or a basket or a home run or something else that stirs you or something like that. It, same type of thing happens with soccer, apparently. But there's just something that stirs in you that has this automatic reaction. Or if something funny happens, it, it's, it's not something that you think about. It just spontaneously happens. Amen? You've ever had anything like that happen to you? Of course, we all have. So when we hear from Paul speaking to the Romans, he says quite beautifully, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption through which you cry out, Abba, Father. So I ask you to take a moment and reflect on the type of spirit that you've received. You have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. I mean, what does that spirit of slavery look like? Imagine for a moment the relationship between a slave and a master. The slave is property. And the slave approaches the master as such, as property. Not significantly different than cattle or plows or a field. I mean, how do we approach? When we think about how we approach God, do we approach God out of, as Paul says, fear, trembling? Are we cautious, anxious, nervous? You see, the slave approaches the master, in one sense, out of, as a beggar hoping that, that, that if, if they've been blessed, if they've been good, if they've done what they're supposed to do, they will be showered and bestowed with the blessings of the master. When you think about the words that you describe, the manner in which you approach uh, God, what words do you use? Is it words such as confidence and, and expectation and joy, and, or is it obligation, trep trepidation, fear? Paul says, you have not received. Huh? Do we go before God as if we don't want to bother him and we're afraid we're going to make him mad? I mean, one sense we could ask ourselves, how do we do this with the bishop? Because in some ways I think we, we may do that same thing as a bishop. Now, I obviously don't have the same response, relationship as a bishop that you do. And it may be hard for some of you to believe, but we have actually had a provincial that has not been the most fatherly person ever. Amen? I know who it was. I know that voice. It raises the question, I mean, how do we go before God, but also how do we go before bishops? Huh? Because we are sons. And we need to be able to claim that, that we are not slaves, we are not employees. huh? So even if the master or the bishop or the provincial, whoever it is that we're supposed to go to, even if they don't see themselves or treat us as fathers, that we are still sons and we can go before them as such. 
with a confidence. And I know that that's difficult, but it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. How do we approach God and how do we approach our bishop, our provincial, our authorities, our pastor? I'm not going to deal with how you approach your wife. That's a whole other issue that we don't have time for. <laughs> uh, nor do I have the expertise to actually even talk about that, huh? But Paul says that we go before not with the spirit of slavery, rather with the spirit of adoption that allows us to cry out, Abba. Abba. We heard Dr. Bergsman talk on, on Monday and Tuesday about the occasions with which the scriptures speak of God as Father. And I think he said, what was it, 30 some odd times in the Old Testament. And it was all covenantal language. Never is the term Abba used in the Old Testament. So Jesus is saying something different than what was referred to or referenced to in the Old Testament, that Jesus says, Abba, and we've heard this so many times that it doesn't cause us to be sh kind of shaken. I mean, imagine if, if, if the scripture was, the Spirit comes upon us and cries out, we cry out, sugar daddy. <laughs> I mean, because that's, it, that's just shocking, or sweetie, or I don't know what it is, but but we need to understand that when Jesus says that we cry out, Abba, that there was something so shocking about that that it caused an entire population of people to turn against Jesus. He may have been okay, but when he begins to speak about God like Abba, there's something wrong with this. That I remember a friend of mine, he always had to call his dad either father or sir. And it just seems so strange to me to, to have to call your father. And he was, un, as you can imagine, very stern and very... And, and he was father, but I don't know if he was Abba. That, that there's something different between father, and, and I understand all the beauty that there is in that, but, but it's clear that Jesus, Jesus brings something into the conversation and invites us to look at God in a radically different way. And it's not only Father, but it's a type of Father. And the type of Father that Jesus wants to reveal is Abba. Paul says in the Romans that the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we receive a spirit of adoption that causes us to cry out. In the same way I cry out when the Broncos score a touchdown, I didn't think about what I was going to say. It just instinctively comes from me and I holler or whatever. It says the Spirit comes upon us and we cry out, Abba. Interestingly, it's the Spirit doesn't cause us to cry out, Savior, Redeemer, Yahweh, the Holy One, the Glorious One, or anything. The Spirit comes upon us, brothers, and what we cry out is Daddy. Huh? If you want to get this image, go online, and if you feel like you're melancholic and you want a good cry, go online and watch when, when GIs are coming back from, the war, from Afghanistan and all that, and they show these pictures of these little kids, and the little moms aren't saying, okay, what I want you to do is when your dad comes out, I want you to run out and I want you to yell, Daddy. Nobody has to tell the kids that because they know what to scream when they see their daddy running to them, huh? In none of the videos did I see did they run out and say, Father or Sir. Daddy. spirit comes upon us and we don't have to think about it brothers have have you experienced that have you experienced the holy spirit coming upon you in a manner with which you cry out daddy because in that there's a tenderness and there's a beauty and there's a peace and there's a safety in daddy huh so oftentimes even with father and, and again i'm not that's an important image obviously but jesus makes us it's the type of father that jesus reveals huh it's the father that I can run up and I can jump on his lap and I know that I'm not bothering him. I know that I'm not an intrusion. I know that he has time for me. I know that he notices me. That's daddy, huh? Father maybe is behind a desk, but, but Jesus, it's not just father. It's a type of father. And there was a great movie years ago. I think it was, I think it was called Parenthood with Steve Martin in it. There was this one scene, this guy, he said, anybody can be a father, but not, anybody can be uh, uh, an, an idiot by just getting some gal pregnant to be a father, uh, but only a few people can be daddy. Huh? It's one of those. 
that that's the type of God we have, that, that, that when, when, we, when the Spirit comes upon us and something cries out and what we cry out is Father, is Abba, it's Daddy, it understands that we have this relationship and this intimacy. There's something intimate about that word Daddy, such, a, such that we rarely speak like that. When we speak about God, we speak of Father, or yeah, but imagine changing our lexicon over the next weeks and months, and when we refer to God, we refer to God as Daddy. There's an intimacy in that. And those of you who are deacons, you, you have that blessing that, that I don't have. I mean, I love, I remember when my niece first used my name. She couldn't say uncle, and she called me Uncle Dave, and it was the best thing in the world. I don't know what it's like to have a child of mine call me daddy. And those of you who are deacons can speak to that in a, in a manner in which that we as fathers can't on so many levels. But that intimacy, that's why some of the, some of the students I've had over the years, they'll call me padre, and there's something about that that's, it's intimate, huh? Daddy. The Spirit comes upon us, and we cry out, Daddy. And, and in that place, there is safety, and there's intimacy, and there's gentleness, and that we know that we're seen, and, and we know that we're not interrupting. How do we go before the Lord? Do we go before the Lord as Master, or do we go before the Lord as Abba? How do we approach God? I love watching my little nieces and nephews around. It doesn't matter what my little, my little brother's an attorney up in Cleveland. He could have a whole thing full of papers and contracts and all that kind of thing. And when they were little, they would just run up and just move it all because they knew that they could go to their daddy. It didn't matter what was going on. Because they knew that at that moment that they would have their daddy's attention. They didn't have to talk him into it. They, that he was... He, he saw them. He noticed them. Do we go before the Lord as daddy? But I always found it interesting that Paul speaks of, of this spirit of adoption which cries out, Abba, Father. And I always thought about that. Well, why the spirit of adoption? I mean, isn't, isn't there something that's kind of subtle in us that adoption is second rate? I mean, isn't it better to be born? I mean, that, that when my mom and dad in their love conceived me, uh, that there's something beautiful about that and, and that they didn't put me up for adoption. I mean, isn't it better that, why didn't he say that, w that we have a spirit of being a son or a daughter? Why does he qualify it with a spirit of adoption? Why doesn't he just say we cry out as a child, Abba, Father? But he doesn't. He says that we cry out, we will receive as a spirit of adoption, huh? Well, in Roman law, and obviously Paul's writing to the Romans here, makes the same reference in Galatians, but in Romans law, that, that when you had a child, if that child wasn't perfect, uh, you could abandon that child. Now, when my mom and dad had me, uh, I come out, and they're literally stuck with me. It's like, well, I guess you're my son, I guess you're my parents, so we're stuck with each other, huh? Now, they got a pretty good deal in this, if I don't say so. <laughs> and so did I, huh? But in Roman law, that wasn't the case. If the child wasn't exactly what you wanted, you could abandon the child. You wanted a girl and you got a boy, you could abandon that child. Your child was only born with four fingers, you could abandon that child. This is becoming more real in me. Over the last couple of years, I've gone to China a number of times. And literally, they will abandon children if they have this, what we always called an angel's kiss, a little mark, you know, a little red mark or something like that. If the child has anything wrong with them, since they can only have one child, they'll abandon them. I work with this group of nuns that will wake up in the morning and there will be babies at their front doorstep. There's a big sign by the police, don't leave your babies here. Huh? But these sisters will take the baby in and they'll hide it so that the police don't find out about it. If that child isn't perfect and you only get one, they abandon the child. Same thing in Roman law. If it wasn't perfect, if you've been to the church of the, uh, the hospital of the Holy Spirit in Rome, just down the street uh, from the Vatican, there's this little turnstile. And, and what it was for was in, in the early days that you could place this baby in the turnstile and close it and it would open up to the convent. You could just leave that and abandon that baby there for any reason. Unless you adopt that child. If you adopt a child, you can never abandon that child. The thinking was that you know what you're getting. That when you adopt a child, you adopt perhaps a child among many. So you see these child and you want this child. 
So it didn't matter after the, the process of adoption in Roman law. Once you've adopted that child, you could never abandon it. And not only that, but that child got the same rights as any other child. And if that child or that ch child's family had any debts, anything held against it, all of those were wiped clean. That this child was now one of your own. And once you adopted that child, you could never abandon it. You could never walk away. You knew fully what you were getting. You knew the good, you knew the bad, you knew the warts, you knew the fat, you knew all of that, and you adopt, you choose this child, and you can never abandon it. Hence, when Paul says that the spirit of adoption comes upon you, he's reminding us that the father, the daddy, the spirit of adoption, which allows us to cry out, Abba, that we will never be abandoned. That the Lord has chosen us. He has picked us. He knows everything about us. That's one of the things I love about uh, when David is chosen in, in 2 Samuel. That they bring, and we know all the stories, they bring all the sons. This one, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, huh? Well, there's only one left, and it's the youngest. And as it imagined, the youngest is out in the field because he pulled the short straw. Well, let's see him. And David comes out, and he's young, and he's ready looking. And, and he says, anoint him. And think about this. God knew everything about David. What, are the, what do we know about David eventually? Huh? That David is going to uh, co ha commit adultery, that have a child born out of wedlock, have that father's child, uh, that father murdered because of, to try to cover up the sin. I mean, if we had a president that did something like that, he probably wouldn't have a positive rating. And yet we all have a fairly positive feeling about David. Amen. And God saw David and he knew everything that was David was going to do. And he still chose David. Why? Because David's heart was turned towards the Lord. Did that mean that David was going to always do things perfect? Absolutely not. But God chose him. Knowing his weakness. Knowing his brokenness. Knowing his difficulty. God still chooses him. As God has chosen you. And he has chosen me. And at times I remind him of that. This was not my idea. Huh? And he still chooses me. Hopefully, because my heart is turned towards him. And at times this heart wanders and looks away. And the Lord still chooses me and still chooses you in the manner and in a way that says, I will never abandon you. I've chosen you among others. And I will never walk away from you. I will never abandon you. I will never leave you orphaned. I always have time for you. I always notice you. I see those things that you do that nobody else knows. I see your fear of the dark that nobody else understands. And I still choose you. And I choose you, and I desire to be your Abba, your daddy in all the intimacy and the vulnerability and and the fear and the and the confusion and the wonderings and the why me's and couldn't you have found somebody else and it seems like I don't quite do it right and, and God still chooses David and he still chooses me and he still chooses you and he will never abandon us. And for the Spirit has come upon us and we cry out, Abba. And my prayers for you, brother, is, is that we experience that, that we really do experience the presence of the Holy Spirit that comes upon us that allows us to cry out, Abba. Because what the Spirit does, and it's what we saw in one sense in that, that image, that sculpting last night, that the, that the Spirit holds, a, holds the Father and the Son together, and, and the Spirit reveals the Father, and the Spirit reveals the Son. But in John, Jesus says, that Jesus reveals the Father. He says, he, in John 10, 30, he and the Father, he and the Father are one. In John 5, 19, Jesus answered, and he said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, a son cannot do anything on his own, 
but he can only see what he see, what he sees the he can only do what he sees the father doing for what he does his son will also do what the father does the son will also do for the father loves his son and shows him everything that he himself has done the son can do nothing by himself so we should probably stop trying If Jesus reveals anything, particularly in the Gospel of John, is that he can do nothing without the Father. And if Jesus could do nothing apart from the Father, I suggest that we can do less than nothing, although I don't know what less than nothing is. I had this cool encounter that happened one time was with a student, and um, it's when I was living in Europe. And we had gone out, myself and a bunch of students had gone out one evening, and it was kind of cold, and one of the students, one of the gals, didn't have a jacket on. It was kind of chilly, so one of the guys took off his jacket and very heroically and gave, gives him the, her jacket, and his jacket, and she puts on a jacket, and it gets all warm and all that. So he kind of walks through the rest of the evening a little bit cold, but he offers it up for, for this gal. Amen? We would have done the same thing, right? Good Lord, this is a cold group. <laughs> so, a couple of days later, I'm talking to another student, and, and she was recounting this whole experience. She, she had watched this whole thing happen, and she had watched this guy give his jacket to her, and she says to me, you know, Father Dave, that never happens to me. Guys never give me their jacket. I said to her, I said, well, didn't you have a jacket? Well, yes, but guys never give me theirs. Well, you had a jacket. Well, I know because I'm not stupid. It was cold and I went out. I wasn't going to go out without a jacket because I'm not dumb. But, but nobody ever gives me. It's like you had a jacket. Nobody is going to give you another jacket, huh? <laughs> then we began to talk and we began to pray. She never lets anybody take care of her. She always covers her bases. She's always self-sufficient. She's never going to be caught out without a jacket. And as such, she's never going to have the experience of a man giving her her jacket. And I think we do the same thing with God sometimes, you guys. I, I think what we do is we try to cover our bases such that we never really allow the Lord to give us his jacket, huh? That we never really allow the Lord uh, to take care of us, to rescue us. That the we cover our bases such that we never really have to count on the Lord. Jesus could do nothing without the Lord, but we want to build everything that we're doing and make sure that we don't really have to count on the Lord because there's a part of us that's afraid that he's really not going to come through. And the reality is, is it's us that's going to look stupid, not him. So we do everything we can to try, try to create our ministry and all that we do so that we really don't have to trust in Jesus or trust in the Father. So we never risk very much. We never go a little bit further. We never try anything really new unless we're absolutely positive this is going to succeed. We never allow ourselves to walk on water because we're afraid we're going to drown. I love when, when we went uh, water skiing one time. It was my father and my uncle, my brothers and my nephews and all that. And my little nephew was maybe, he'd never water skied in his life. He was maybe five or six years old, you know. And he jumps out. It's time to go water skiing. It's like, okay, who's going to go first? And my little nephew literally jumps out of the boat into the water. He's never water skied in his life. And he's like ready to go. And I said to him, I said, Jacob, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to go water skiing. I said, well, do you have any idea what you're doing? No, no idea at all. Well, do you know how to water ski? Nope. What are you doing? He goes, don't worry, Uncle Dave. Papa's not going to let me drown. I mean, he jumped in there, and if Papa isn't paying attention, he's going to drown. 
but Papa's not going to let him drown. And my concern, brothers, is, is that we never really get out of the boat, or we never get to that place that we really have to trust in God, or, or we really understand more fully that we can do nothing. If we're honest, most of what we do, we know what we're doing. Because we're good at it, or we've done it before, or we've been successful. But do we really come to the place that I have to trust in you? That I am absolutely, radically, totally dependent on you, Father. And if you don't come through, I'm toast. You all received that little thing. that, And I just shared this, uh, the Wild Goose. It's a, it's a project that I'm working on, because, and I'm going to talk about this near the end. Uh, I think one of the things the church needs is to have a deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit doesn't belong to a group. It doesn't belong to the charismatic renewal. It belongs to the church, huh? The charismatic renewal has obviously done something beautiful at, at helping us see the Holy Spirit. But for me, this was a step in faith, having to go out and, and raise money and, and put all of this stuff out there. And, and I remember saying, God, you've got to show up. You've got to, you've got to show up. And and there was this, for a little while, there was this tension and kind of this nervousness and anxiety. And before I'd go to sleep, it's like, you know, what if I don't raise the money, blah, blah, blah. But, but there comes this place that I said, Lord, this wasn't my idea, and I'm going to give it to you. And if it's going to work, it's going to work. If it's not, it's going to not. But I've done what I think you want me to do, huh? And, and, and I'll talk more specifically about the project a little bit later. But the money was raised in less than 14 days. So I didn't have to worry about it anymore. I didn't have to think about it anymore. God is faithful, huh? And he's not going to let us drown. And he's going to take care of us. But what it demands of us is that we come to the place that we realize that we are dependent on God. Not our own strength, not our own power, not our own influence, not our own position. But I am radically dependent on God. And God, if for a moment you turn your face from me, I am toast. And if we've got the courage that we pray, Lord, put me in a position where I have to depend on you, where I have no other option but to depend on you. And I suggest that that's a scary prayer. It's like the first time, the first, the only time I went skydiving. I mean, when you're sitting there with your feet over the, the, over the plane and you're about to jump, there's a moment of reckoning at that point, huh? Like, this shoot better open up, or my parents are going to be pissed. Right. So it's my provincial who didn't know about it till after the fact. Ultimately, the opposite of dependence is autonomy and independence. I suggest for too many of us priest brothers, we deep in our heart desire, even, yeah, we desire autonomy. And by that, radical independence that says, I want to do whatever I want to do. And, and, and if, I'll be honest, um, if I'm honest, I want the support of the provincial when I want the support of the provincial. But sometimes it's better just to be quiet and not see. Amen? Or maybe that's just a religious issue. Maybe diocesan never have to deal with that. We desire to be autonomous from, from God, from one another. Do we really want to be seen? Do we want that accountability? We desire to be autonomous from uh, the bishop, unless we need something. It seems to me that one of the ways the evil one is working today is the spirit of, of, of autonomy and independence. And oddly enough, it's the only the evil one who's actually autonomous. The Lord has given him that. Fine. Be autonomous. Be separated from me. We need to pray, brothers, for a spirit of dependency rather than a spirit of autonomy. Rather than a spirit of independence that says not only I radically need the father, I, a son, need a father, but I need brothers. Brothers who will support and encourage and, 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 and rejoice in my rejoicing and suffer in my sufferings that, that this, this living in shadows or being seen when, we're, when everything is going well, when we feel strong or hiding, when we feel nervous or anxious or, or, or insecure, 
we need to pray, brothers, to be released and to free, be freed from the spirit of autonomy. And, and actually be grafted, huh? be grafted to the Lord, be grafted to the Father, be grafted to Jesus, be grafted to the church. Amen? Jesus was distinct from the Father, but he was not autonomous. So we don't lose our distinction. We don't lose our individual beauty and our goodness and, and, and our selfness, huh? By being connected, by being dependent. In fact, it's quite the opposite. That when I'm radically dependent on the Father, I am more myself. I am more distinct in myself. Huh? Amen? So... Again, the, the Spirit reveals the Father, and then Jesus says that I can only see what I, I can only do what I see the Father doing. So I wanted for a moment or two just to talk about that. What might we see the Father doing? And when I pray and you know, when I spend time reflecting, what do I see the Father doing today? In the image I have is the Father, and he's, it's an arm, huh? It's a large, a powerful arm. And, and when I pray, when I see this image, what I hear is that the Father is holding back his hand. He is holding back his arm. And that on one side of this is, is God's people, and on the other side is the culture that we find ourselves in today. The darkness, the confusion, the chaos, and that the Father is holding back his judgment. He's holding back his justice, holding back his wrath. But it's not just that he's holding back, back, but those who are on the other side of his hand, the other side of his arm, he's protecting. He's separating. He's keeping us away from. Brothers, I pray and I continue to pray for our culture and for abortion and, and all of these youth. We're going to talk about some of these issues in a moment. But I think the Lord is going to give us as a culture what the culture asks for. I think we will reap what we sow. And we will sow what we reap. And, and it's not to say that, that I don't believe in the power of prayer and that God can do things and do amazing things because I do. But I also believe in a God who's going to give us what we ask for as a culture. Oddly enough, I find myself reflecting on the words of Thomas Jefferson, if you've been to the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. He says, I fear for our country at, a God who is, at the thought of a God who is just and a God who cannot hold back his justice forever. And that was 200 and how many years ago. And that's this image I have of, of the Lord's arm and in one sense, holding back his justice. But he won't and can't hold it back forever. And what that's creating in our world, in the world that we're getting exactly what we're asking for, is absolute chaos. It's almost like it's returning before God gives order to, to, to the world in, in this chaos that is in, going on in the world. That that's what we're getting back to, is radical confusion. Radical disintegration. But interestingly enough, I think what we're seeing is we're literally seeing evil fight against evil. And what the Lord is doing is he, he's protecting us. He's, he's holding back his arm. And if, if we hide in the shadow of his wing, huh, that the Lord will protect us. First, Second Timothy says, For the time will come when the people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but following their own desires and insatiable curiosity, they will stop listening to the truth, and they will be diverted to myths. I think that that's, I mean, when I pray and I see and we look at what's going on in our culture, I think that's exactly what we're seeing. I remember what John Paul said when he was in St. Louis. He said that when you separate truth from freedom, the very moral fabric of society begins to unravel. When truth is separated from freedom, when truth becomes the ability to do whatever anybody wants, and whatever is true for you is true for you, doesn't matter what that is, doesn't matter if it contradicts everything else, if you believe it to be true, then it's true. When you separate that from freedom, when freedom is the ability to do whatever you want to do, the very moral fabric of society begins to ravel. And I suggest that that's exactly what we're seeing, is that we've had a radical separation of truth and freedom and the very society is beginning to unravel. So how do we see this? 
We see it all around us, so help us shine a light on this. We see it in human life and the dignity and the value and the beauty of human life. The next real issue that we're going to see, and we're beginning to see it, is, is the assisted suicide. A quote from a leading uh, proponent of assisted suicide says, a person should be able to choose assisted suicide if it will free them um, from any unhappiness. I'd have been toast a long time ago, huh? To free us from any unhappiness. But I suggest, brothers, that that's where we're going to see the battle in the next 10, 15, 20 years. As we're seeing an aging population, as we're seeing health care increase, increase, we're going to see an increase in assisted suicide. Human life in general. The attack against women. I remember reading an article, and it said, Woman will not truly be free until she is freed from the shackles of childbirth. Until she is free from the shackles of childbirth. To think that the, the, the debate over contraception in the government today is merely a matter of contraception, it's, a, it's an assault against women. And as Mary shared the other night, uh, Adam wasn't standing at the post. I mean, how is it that the evil one, the serpent one, was able to get to Eve because Adam wasn't standing the post. And now we have a full-out attack against women, and oftentimes, brothers, men are silent. And we use language, and the culture uses language like freedom, and they totally bastardize these words. And we're going to continue to see the culture get what it asks for. Amen? We see a radical, as we know, we see a radical fight against family and against the sacrament of marriage. Headline in the Pittsburgh newspaper last week. Father marries his son. Welcome. Here's the situation. It's two guys wanted to get married because it provided them some advantages, tax purposes, and all that, but it was against the law to get married in Pennsylvania. So one adopted the other. So now you get the tax advantages of being a family. So these two guys that were in a relationship adopted. One adopted the other, even though they were lovers, but they thought that this would be a great way. Now that marriage is, gay marriage is actually legal, um, he's married his son. Is it just me or is that strange? It's not just me? Good, good, good. They will begin to tolerate, they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but they will follow their own desires and their curiosities. They will stop listening to the truth and they will be diverted to myths. This isn't simply an assault against marriage between man and woman. It's an assault against marriage. I mean, if we think that this is going to stop just between man and woman, man and man, woman, it's, it's not. It's, it's going to get more complicated than that. And on one level, I, I fully expect the Supreme Court next week to come out and legalize gay marriage. I, I just don't see how it's not going to do that. So what it provides for us is teachable moments. That over the last probably year, when I speak of marriage, I speak of Christian marriage. Government can call what they want. It's not Christian marriage. So an activist speaking against marriage says, I have three kids who are from five parents, more or less. I don't know what that means, more or less. But he says, I have, she says, I have three kids from five parents, more or less. And I don't see why they shouldn't have five parents legally. I met my new partner, and she had just had a baby. And that baby's biological father is my brother. And my daughter's biological father is a man who lives in Russia. And my adopted son also considered him as his father. So the five parents break down into two groups or three. Really, I would like to be able to live as a legal system capable of reflecting this new reality. And I don't think that's compatible with the institution of marriage. So marriage should be destroyed. It's not simply an attack against man. It's an attack against the fundamental nature of marriage and the need to have marriage in our society. Amen? It's a fundamental war, and, and what we're seeing more and more, and we've spoke about this several times, is it's, it's a battle against men. And in, in, in presenting men as being non-important. Again, we've talked about this before in the past. Take a look at most sitcoms and how are men represented in most sitcoms. 
is idiots. You know, it's just idiots, right? There's a Latin saying that some of you probably know, I only know it in English, but the corruption of that which is best is worst. Louis de Montfort would speak of the corruption of that which is best is worst. So if we can corrupt marriage, if we can corrupt manhood, if we can corrupt family, it becomes the worst. And, and particularly with our theme this week, I, I think that we see that in this, in this relationship with Father. I mean, the, it's interesting. The Spirit comes upon us, and what we cry out is Abba. What we cry out is Daddy. The Spirit causes us to cry out Daddy. If we can mess that up, that fundamental idea of Father, if we can mess that up and, and, and cause confusion and anxiety and frustration and chaos in and, and, and the idea of Father. Huh? There's a woman by the name of Heather Bartwick. She's a mother of four. She was raised by two lesbian women. She says, my father's absence created a huge hole in me. And I ached every day for a dad. I loved my mom's partner. But another mom could never have replaced the father that I lost. I grew up surrounded by women who said that I didn't need or want a man. Yet, as a little girl, I so desperately wanted a daddy. It's a strange and confusing thing to walk around with this deep down unquenchable ache for a father, for a man, in a community that says men are not necessary. Gay marriage doesn't just define marriage, it defines parenting. It promotes and normalizes a family structure that necessarily denies us something that is precious and foundational, a dad. It denies us something we need and we long for, while at the same time tells us that we don't need what we naturally crave, that we will be okay, but we're not. We're not okay. We're hurting. Just this beautiful reflection of this woman's experience of being raised in a couple, with a couple, a lesbian couple. But then the other side is true. Well, someone would say, well, then two gay men. I mean, great, you've got two fathers, huh? But I consider both confusing. I mean, the image you have of a woman, somebody being raised with no father, is she's just always, always looking, you know, looking for something to fill that void and that emptiness. And you just have this image of her of searching the empty. But a person being raised with two fathers, we have a father. We have a father. And that father satisfies us. And as she mo so much more beautifully stated than I could, that, that we fundamentally desire and have a, a, an ache and an emptiness for that. And yet our culture tells us and is telling us that it's not necessary. That what is really only necessary is love. By their own def definition of love. Amen? Amen? So we're finding other tacks. Again, what, what we're doing, we're looking at the culture, we're seeing, what does the Father see? What do we see when we look at our culture today? Huh? This is a quote you've probably heard recently because it's been in the news. Uh, she believes that those who question our identi her identity don't understand how it works, that her self-definition is the only thing that matters. And who said that? Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner? No. Rachel Dolezal. Rachel Dolezal is the gal who uh, identifies herself as black. She was the head of the NAACP in Spokane, Washington. And she identifies herself as black. I've had maybe a week to give this some thought and, and reflection. Uh, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar, she was the head of the NAACP in Spokane, Washington. She, um, there's this interview, they're talking with her, and they ask this question. They ask her, are you an African American? And she says, well, what do you mean by the question? That's not a tricky question. Well, as it turns out, there's photos that come up that her, she's white. Her mom's white, her dad's white. She's, you know, she looks black when you look at her. She says, um, those who question my identity don't understand how it works, that her self-definition is the only thing that matters. She goes on to say, when I was young, drawing self-portraits, I used brown crayons instead of peach crayons. Now, she's being accused of lying, being deceitful, saying that she um, 
here's some of the quotes that, that are being placed out there. And they're making, obviously, comparisons because she stated that she feels um, some sympathy and some connectedness to Bruce Jenner. Because Bruce Jenner said that this is how he felt, and, and she's saying the same thing, that she's felt like she, since she was a little girl, like she was black. Now, this is what I was saying that I think what we're seeing is, is one sense, evil fighting against evil. She's hijacked the conversation about tra transgendered people, says Maudy Mills, an activist. We were having a very important conversation in America about transgendered issues, thanks to Caitlyn Jenner. Jenner, and here comes Rachel Dozel, and she just sucks up, sucks up all the oxygen in the room. <laughs> Another woman says, as a black lesbian who spent my professional life working on advocacy and expanding the dialogue on transgendered issues, this is extremely offensive to me. Another person says, it's not just offensive, get this, it's not just a offensive, it defies logic. <laughs> this is a, a, a writer. She said, um, transgender transitioning is really hard. And this is a therapist says, being transgendered is not a choice, but lying about your race is deliberate. This from a therapist. If she were coming into my office, I would definitely want to explore the reasons why she wasn't transparent about her identity. And then maybe in this crazy world, a voice of reason. Let her be black woman. She's not hurting anyone. But what we're seeing is, is utter chaos. That somebody who is, who is promoting transgender saying that that what she is saying what this black woman is saying defies logic but what I'm proposing this transgender that this woman was t that doesn't defy logic huh we are seeing evil compete against evil in chaos compete against chaos and I think the Lord is just holding back his arm and letting us protecting us and as a culture and as a people allowing us to have exactly what we ask for. The challenge for us, brothers, is to be on the right side of that arm, is to being allowing the Lord to protect and to defend and to bring light and to bring order and to bring peace and to bring presence. When we think about and take a look at what the Lord is doing in the church, again, Jesus says, I can only do what I see the Father. So what do we see the Father doing in the church? Huh? We see him purifying. And we see him pruning. And we've experienced that, brothers. And in, in each, each month or each year, I say, okay, well, maybe this is the year that we're coming out of that. And I don't know. But it's fundamentally scriptural, and it's fundamentally the way the Lord works in his people, in his church, is through pruning. He does it in me, and the day that I stop experiencing that pruning is probably the day that I'm not seriously going before the Lord. And say, I feel pruned fine, I feel fine. And, and Pope Francis says that as soon as we feel comfortable, something's wrong in our spiritual life. So the church is experiencing this pruning, experiences this purifying, but what's happening with that is the church is becoming more pure. It's like Dr. Bergsma said the other day, the church is becoming smaller. Fine, so be it. Because a lot of these people, they were not being a blessing to the church. They were being the source of disunity or a source of a lack of faith or a source of disruption. So we pray for this purification, but we pray that we're on the right side of it. Amen? The Lord is also, the Father is bringing clarity and he's confirming in the church. The, 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 the lines are being drawn and it's becoming more and more clear in our world that the craziness, it's, it's not as hard to be a light in the midst of the darkness anymore because the world is becoming so dark, we don't have to be that much light to shatter that. But we do need to be the light and we do need to be able to speak the truth. And for that we need courage and we need grace. The other thing, and that's why I did this project, what I see the whole, what the Lord doing is, is pouring forth his Holy Spirit in a new way and in a profound way. I titled this project, what it's going to be, it's going to be a 14-part series on the, on the Holy Spirit, and it's called The Wild Goose. The ancient Celts called the Holy Spirit the Wild Goose, not this domesticated dove, but a wild goose, not exactly sure what the goose is going to do, amen? 
Pope Francis says we ought not to try to tame the Holy Spirit, but I think we try to tame the Holy Spirit, and we like the idea of the Holy Spirit as a flame as long as it's a candle, but if it's a raging fire, it scares the crap out of us, and the first thing we see a raging fire is we want to control it. And the Holy Spirit was never supposed to be controlled. It was always supposed to be a raging fire. And, and, and I'm seeing as I'm traveling across the, po the, the country pockets of, of blessings and Holy Spirit being anointed and people experiencing new profound experiences of the presence of God, their own experience of Pentecost. And you can see this taking place and we need to be able to fan that flame. The other thing that I think we're seeing is mercy. The Holy Father spokes when he speaks of the year of Jubilee of mercy. He says, Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. And these words might well sum up the mystery of the Christian faith. Mercy has become the living, visible, living and visible in Jesus of Nazareth. This year of mercy is, is the great blessing, I think, that the Holy Father has given to us. The particularly, my, my guess is, as diocesan clergy, maybe you guys have heard more of this. We have not spoken to it except I raised the issue my, with my provincial. Um, the, the special blessing that has been given to priests to be, uh, what's the term that they use? Missionaries of mercy. And the bishop is allowing uh, priests to ask for this special blessing to be a missionary of mercy that allows the priest to be able to absolve sins that were hold only for the Holy See. The Holy Father says that the church's maternal solitude would make we priests in confession, missionaries of mercy. That is, specially selected priests who have been granted the authority to pardon even those sins reserved to the Holy See. The priests will be chosen on the basis of their ability to preach well, but also on ability to speak to mercy, that they would be good confessors, that they would make the confessional a place of mercy rather than a torture chamber, that they would be patient, that they would have an, a human, an understanding of human frailty. I mean, that's a special blessing and grace that the Lord, that the Holy Father is giving to us. Huh? And then when I look upon this, this is what is radically needed and what the Father is beginning to do is pour forth his mercy upon us. And the amazing thing is what opens up that door of mercy is our brokenness and our sin. And it's the only thing that can open up. That God's mercy doesn't shower upon us because I'm so good. Because I'm so talented, because I'm so great, because I'm so wonderful. Rather, it's quite the opposite. It's because of my brokenness, and it's because of my sinfulness, and my, by grace to go before the Lord, he showers that mercy upon me. And it's the only thing that's going to unlock the door to mercy. And when I look upon and I look out in the church, I see a people that desperately need mercy. And that this year of mercy... The church and the Holy Father, and, and I believe the Father God, is allowing us and inviting us to be agents of that mercy. I mean, where are you seeing the Father work? Where are you seeing God in your particular ministry? Do we even have eyes that can see? Or are we so busy and so consumed that all we see is the desk in front of us, and we don't take a step back and look upon this terrain and see, okay, God, what are you doing here? What do you want me to do? What's something new? I mean, I mean, I've said this before, but I think sometimes we operate out of a grace that's 40 years old. What do you want me to do today, Lord? What do you want me to do tomorrow? But oftentimes we don't look at that and we don't see what God is doing. So when Jesus says, I can only do what I see the Father doing, <coughs> do we see what the Father is doing? I've asked a couple of people, we're going to have a deacon, de Dan, right? Yeah, why don't you come on up. I've just asked Dan to, to speak for a moment or two what he sees, how he sees God working in his seminary. And I need that, the, the mic, if Dan can come up. Just what he sees God doing in the seminary for a moment. Hello? Great, you can hear me. Father Dave makes this look so easy, I am scared to speak before the assembly, but I'll try my best. Um, what I see going on in the seminary, well, I attended, sorry, my name is Deacon Daniel Kingsley, I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and by God's grace, I will be a priest June 28th, so please, in your kindness, pray for me. Amen. Um, and... 
I attended St. Joseph Seminary in Yonkers, New York for the past three years, and what I see there is that God is trying to make evident to us the needs of his church, the needs of his people. Um, very often in seminary, we could be in, instead in the trap of, oh, the liberals are fighting, the conservatives are fighting, um, should we do this in Latin, should we do this in the vernacular, should we do this um, praise and worship song, and very often the fights in seminary would sometimes evolve into that. But God in his grace, God in his mercy, through the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes and asked the question, how do we best serve the people of God who are hungry for God? How do we best serve the people who one day will call us father in the parishes? And how do we will one day stand before God and, ask, and answer the question, have you served my kingdom? Have you served my church to the best of your ability? And I remember there was a time in my seminary formation which I was scared like nobody's business. Um, I was going, how do I phrase this? Um, a year away from Diak and I was thinking to myself, did I have any business to go before the rector, to go before the faculty and say, I believe I'm a good candidate for holy orders, let me sign the paperwork. And I was thinking to myself, no, no, and by the way, oh hell no. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was that my good friend, who's now a priest, Father Evans, I told him all this, my fears, my concerns, and Father Evans said, Daniel, would you want me to pray over you? And at that point, I was not, <laughs> the idea of the charismatic, the, the idea of charismatic prayer left me uneasy because I'm thinking to myself, would, uh, I, I don't speak in tongues, I'm not gonna fall over, I, I just don't know about this. But I figured, you know what? Prayer is prayer. So what's the worst that could happen? So Father Evans and two other seminarians, we went to the chapel, the Blessed Sacrament Chapel of our seminary, and they prayed over me. And at that particular moment, I felt God's grace telling me that, okay, Daniel, you may feel unworthy, you may feel overwhelmed, you may feel stressed, but if you believe that I'm calling you to this, I'll give you the grace, I'll give you the skills necessary to feed my sheep, to go out there, preach the word, and to exercise Christian charity. And that made things a little bit more easier. That thing made things comfortable. That, you know what? I'm not perfect. I fall short of the mark. Um, my dear friend Jose, who's back there, uh, Deacon Jose from my diocese as well, will tell you that I am the king of procrastination. I'm probably the only guy in the history of the seminary to finish an MA thesis, I think, five minutes before the due hour. M.A. Cum Laude, how I don't know. Um, but anyway, that, that God works through broken vessels, God works through broken instruments and strengthens them. Or as a friend of mine, seminary would also often remind me, and Jose as well, that God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the calls. And in your kindness to end, I ask you guys, I ask all of you, fathers, deacons, to pray for an increase of vocations to the priesthood. And as we've spoken of here these past few days, the idea of fatherhood. Fatherhood entails propagation, more of, and that in your own parishes, in your own diocese, encourage men, invite men to consider calls to the priesthood because I wouldn't be standing here today if a priest in high school didn't invite me further to the seminary. I wouldn't be here if a priest in a Father Gannon, if Father Gannon didn't encourage me to consider the priesthood and stick to it. So please, in your own diocese, in your own parishes, invite men to stick to it, to invite them to the priest and tell them that it's worth it. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's my understanding that a deacon is also going to share. Good. Deacon, if you want to just come and just, just share what you see the Father doing, what you see God doing as a deacon as well. Sure, I'm supposed to share uh, what I see what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world and what's going on in the world, and Father Dave covered everything, right? Um, I, I was world. also thinking world. I was also thinking that you better pray that your provincial doesn't see this time. <laughs> You're T-O-R, right? So you'll be third ordered retired. That's right. I, so I was thinking, well, what's going on? What's going on in the world? What's going on in the nation? What's going on uh, with us here? And, 
and I first thought about what's going on in the world. In the early 80s, I was at a meeting uh, with an agency that will remain unnamed, and they had a study that s predicted that the Soviet Union would fall by 1992. Well, it fell in 1988. So they were, uh, weren't as optimistic as they should have been. But they predicted it. But they did not predict that the next world struggle would be over religion. Who would have predicted that a few years ago, right? Uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Who would have predicted that? And we look at the world, and I had two sons in Iraq, and they were involved in everything, and it kept, certainly kept their mother and father on their knees, all right? And <coughs> who, who would have predicted that struggle? But we, we look at the United States, and we're fighting about religious freedom in the United States of America. Our founding fathers had set that to rest, and, and here we are again. And what is going on? that we should have to fight over this. And in Europe, uh, what's, what's happening with our faith in Europe and what's happening with our faith in the country? And we, we, t we talk about that a lot, you know? And uh, are we are getting away from the truths of our faith and even with our people? I, I think the Pope is right that we're, we're going through a pruning period. But I also think about what that saint said, that in tough times, saints are made. And uh, Archbishop Chaput uh, quoted the uh, late Cardinal of Chicago saying that he fully expected to die in bed, but he expected his successor to die in prison, possibly, and his successor to be martyred for the faith. Are we willing to be martyred for our faith? Where are we in, in our faith? You know, where are we personally? Uh, I believe we don't live for ourselves. We don't, it's not about me. And I ask myself, do I love Jesus? Am I in love with Jesus? Yeah, I love Jesus, I love the Holy Spirit, I love the Father, but am I in love with Jesus? Just like a 16-year-old is so in love with the other that he just lives for the other. Am I in love with Jesus? And if I'm in, in love with Jesus, I'll be in love with my wife, in love with my children, in love with the people that I meet. And it's not about me. And if, I'm, if I don't say three rosaries a day, it's not about me. And, and, and if I somehow forget about morning prayer, I'm sorry, but it, it's not about me. And it isn't even really about me going to heaven. It's about me being in love with Jesus. I was concerned about coming this week because I have to preach this weekend several masses. And um, next week, the youth group's going away, and I was asked to go with them, and I, I couldn't do both. And my wife said, you got to go. I said, you mean with the youth group? She said, no, to Steubenville. you got to go. I said, why? Because it renews you. It renews you. It reinvigorates you. you know, it's, it's like pumping life support into your veins. You got to go. And as a deacon, let me say a couple of things, what I think is happening in the church with this pruning. I, looked, I did a little research, and in the 1960s, there were 60,000 Catholic priests in the United States. It's now about 40,000. In the 60s, there were like zero permanent deacons, and it's now about 18,000. Is that a coincidence? Us deacons do not want to be priests or many priests. We are no threat to the priesthood. We love our priests. We are servants. We're ordained table waiters. That's who we are. And we love you. And we want to support you. And we want to use you in any way possible. So if you don't like the finance committee, give it to a deacon. <laughs> hey, you know, if you don't want to get out there and ask for money, 
Tell a deacon to ask for money. I don't mind begging for Jesus. I don't mind it. Right? We love you. We want to support you. We're here for you. I think it's a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Um, finally, Franciscan University is a blessing. In my parish back in Maryland, we have a community of Franciscan graduates. Do you know any of the Nortons? Yeah, they're there. And we, we even have some that are moving into Old Town, Maryland, so that they can be with their brothers and sisters from Franciscan University. And my own daughter and son-in-law has gotten involved with these 20s and 30s, young families something, and has gotten reinvigorated in her faith. And that's what's happening with our young couples. You know, all of a sudden, they're having a rosary group. They have a mom's prayer group. The men are meeting at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning to share with one another and to hold each other accountable. And then they go to 8 o'clock mass, and then they're there to bring their kids to soccer and baseball and everything. Right? So the, the university has been a blessing. And I see the university students out there taking over ministries, the, our, our Rachel project our, and our, our Gabriel project. And they're, they're taking over these ministries. Coincidental? No, it's not coincidental. The work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Franciscan University. And, and I thank Father for that. Now, I know Father's looking at me. I was told th that I had four or five. Oh, was it 45 minutes? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So I, I will uh, turn it over to Father, and uh, we will pray that you don't become a third order retired. Uh, I'm 50 now, so it's all right. Thank you, Deacon. I appreciate it. Okay, let's pray, brothers. First, we, Lord, we thank you and bless you for what you're doing in, in the seminary and just we pray for a peace there Lord that the divisions would come down and those walls would come down Lord. allow them a unanimity of mind and heart that they really do respond to the hunger and the thirst of the people of God we pray too for uh, all the deacons Lord that you continue to shower your blessing upon them that you would raise them up and that they would be lights and instruments of service Father, we pray, we pray that we would be radically dependent on you, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us and we would cry out, Abba, Father, that we would grow in our relationship and our depth, our intimacy with you. Close with a note that I received on my door in the friary yesterday. It's just a, from a religious sister here. She says, Dear brother in the Lord, keep fighting the good fight until the end, for you are the Father's love for us, and we are all healed by that love. Heavenly Father, may we be healed by your love, may we be united to you by your love, and may we be a healing presence in a world that so desperately needs you. We make this prayer in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.